Hoy vamos a entrevistar a Robert Schwab. Él fue uno de los diseñadores de D&D quinta edición, pero luego hizo su propia compañía para publicar Shadow of the Demon Lord, un juego en el que cambió bastante cosas, un juego muy oscuro. Ha publicado otras cosas y su carrera empezó mucho antes, cuando se empezaron a hacer muchos juegos con la licencia OGL. Le vamos a preguntar de sus inicios como jugador de rol, sus inicios como diseñador, su trabajo en D&D y qué vio y en qué influyó en el diseño de quinta edición. Y por supuesto le vamos a preguntar sobre Shadow of the Demon Lord y los otros proyectos en los que ha participado. El último de ellos, un Kickstarter que termina hace muy muy poquito, Shadow of the Weird Wizard. También le vamos a preguntar de tips para diseñadores de juegos que quieran meterse en esta carrera y nos vas a contestar muy francamente. Así que quédate ahí y mira esta entrevista. Uh, Rob, to start our, our interview, uh, this is a question that is uh, it, that gets asked a lot, uh, but it helps us to know our interviewees. And uh, I always wanted to know when did you start playing TTRPGs? I mean, how did you come uh, into the hobby for, for the first time? Uh, it was a, I was pretty young. Um, I think in there would be. Let's see, I would probably say 10 or 11, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe about 10. But uh, yeah, I, it, it was, um, and so D&D &D was something I knew about my, for much of my early years, uh, but I didn't have anyone to play with, and no one I knew uh, knew anything about the game other than Dungeons and Dragons sounds really cool, and so... Um, When I moved to the state of Tennessee, I would uh, there uh, I, I met my neighbor uh, and he sold me a module. Uh, I think it was B8, B6, Rahaja by uh, Tracy and Laura Hickman. It was an interesting module for me to get my start because uh, one, the adventure assumes you're not going to kill anyone, uh, and it has a bunch of goofy, <laughs> weird things inside. Uh, which is a great adventure because it kind of turns D&D up on its head. But uh, I didn't have the rules, so I had to extrapolate from that adventure a set of rules that I could use to run games. And that became the very first role-playing game I designed before playing D&D called Passages. May I live on in its infamy. Uh, that game used just a D6 or two and you would level up when you left one side of a map and went to the other side of the map because i drew all the maps on graph paper so it was pretty pretty straightforward but we had a good time and uh but, but one of my friends uh, on the playground took pity on me and invited me over to his house to talk comic books and also to teach me how to play D&D. and the rest is sort of history and uh, what year was it was this approximately uh, i got to The math, I think, so that would have been 1985. Oh, so right uh, through the satanic panic. Uh, did it, did it oh, affect yeah. you in, in any way? Oh, it did deeply. Uh, my mom uh, and for my mom and her side of the family are deeply, 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 deeply religious. Uh, they are sometimes I joke to them and say they are one flag away from being Hezbollah. But that probably is not, it's not very timely for a thing to say about loud, but they were very religious and uh, they live in this, they live in this universe in which there are angels and demons vying for your soul. And of course, one of the manifestations of Satan's eagerness to claim my juicy, nubile, young soul was through the, through Deep Dungeon Dragons. Years later, I realized that, you know, if Satan did exist, Uh, the best way to capture my soul at the tender age of 13 would have been to send a succubus to me instead because, you know, it would have probably helped keep my room a little more sanitary than, you know, my own uh, own onanism and ambitions. But anyway, so, yeah, uh, she really hated it. So she forced me to sell all my D&D books out of guilt and fear and all that loathing. And uh, so I dumped all that stuff off, but she let me play whatever I wanted other than Dungeons and Dragons, which was interesting because it meant that I got to play Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, for example, which is a far <laughs> more serious and upsetting game. But I played that in Marvel Superheroes and Middle Earth Roleplaying and Twilight 2000 Traveler 
Star Frontiers, Gamma World, DC Heroes. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And so in that, so thanks to my mom's uh, fear and the satanic panic, I was able to experiment with uh, a vast array of role-playing games that I normally pro I probably never would have had exposure to. Um, that of course it also led into I was being an early adopter of Shadowrun. I had the purple book when it came out, and early versions of cy early Cyberpunk, and yeah, I played it all. Uh, but yeah, it was. So thanks, mom. <laughs> Sorry about the festival effect. And, and yeah. one last question about about this: um, Does she still uh, shut your your work? In the, I mean, I know this is a personal question. You don't have to answer if you don't want, but. Uh, no. You you publish Shadow of the Demon Lord. How does that <laughs> right. feel about it? Right. So I uh, I think you know I she would love it if I would do anything else. Um, but I, she's proud of me. And she says she's proud of me. So I'll take that for for what it's worth. Uh, I am 50 almost. So I guess looking for parental approval is something I, I've left far behind. But it does make me happy that she's at least. Uh, she's at least admits that I have done something that she may or may not agree with, but whatever, it's fine. My dad, on the other hand, he's pretty cool with it. Right. So we, we just mentioned Shadow of the Demon Lord and you told us about your first uh, designing in, in TTRPG, <laughs> but in your career, you, you started in the TTRPG during the D20 boom, right? No. Uh, yep. Could you tell us a little bit uh, about how that happened? Sure. Um, right after, one of the things about the when I got into the business and the, you really, my turning this into a full-time gig would not have happened had it not been for the open gaming license. Because um, when when Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition came out, the uh, unveiling of the OGL and the D20 license uh, enabled publishers of all stripes and sizes and shapes and motivations to dump all the D20 content we could ever need and more into the market. Uh, and because of the, there was this vast demand for 3.0 products, uh, there was also a dearth of writers that could fill, could, that could meet that demand. So there was open, there were open calls on almost every website. So what I did was uh, at the time I had just finished college after my second go through and I was selling carpet and I was selling liquor at a liquor store um, and trying to just kind of figure out what I was going to do. And I just started hitting uh, every one of those uh, submission place uh, submissions and sent over pitches to various companies. So I did a couple of books for Mongoose Publishing that led to getting a couple of projects with Green Ronin Publishing most notably Book of Fiends uh, and the Black Company campaign setting. Uh, Green Renine hired me shortly after that, but during that time I also worked for Goodman Games and AEG and fa uh, Fantasy Flight and uh, somebody else I'm missing. But I did, I did tons and tons and tons of stuff. Necromancer Games, uh, I also did something for uh, Calamar. Remember that the Svamoja book? Anyway. Kings of Calamar by Kenzer and Company. That, that was it. Um, and then I also did Grimm for Fantasy Flight Games, which was a real kind of big uh, splash for me. But uh, working with Green Renine Publishing gave me steady income and allowed me to do a little bit more freelancing and also trusted me. It also taught me a ton about game design and managing projects and all those kinds of things that go with it. That's amazing. So it was a... Uh, uh, um... A blowing, a uh, uh, growing industry, no? Yeah, it was time. Yeah, because there was, you know, and even when, if, even after 3.5 came out and took the wind out of the sails, there was still a ton of work for the D for D20. And really, by the time Green Renin was dialing back the D20 stuff, I was already working on uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay and uh, consulting uh, on Dark Heresy and. Then eventually that turned into uh, the Song of Ice and Fire role playing, and then doing freelance work for Wizards, which landed me a job as a contractor, which then led me to go on to work on Fifth Edition, and here I am. But uh, <laughs> it was just a long road of a lot, a lot of books. 
so well you you named a lot of, of of the of the big names in the in the industry uh also you you named more hammer uh but we also have song of fire ice and fire uh Dungeons and dragons and etc what is it like working for games that come with such a huge ip behind them the it's a, it's challenging um because there you know there's a tendency well i never really had a problem in the sense that i think some folks do but i recognize this problem and that is that there is a drive to create something new within the existing space of something where the parameters have already been defined um with song of ice and fire and thieves world and black company these are we, we already have Canon exists within the confines of the books and any ancillary products that may have uh, come out in support of it, uh, which wasn't so much with Thieves World, although there was a little bit and virtually nothing for Black Company. But George R. R. Martin's stuff, we had the Dunkin' Egg books, we had comics, and graphic novels, and map books, and all of that stuff, and in a website that had its blessing. And, you know, so those kind of, those projects were, were you were constrained but also challenge to find spaces within those in which you can tell new stories. Um, the great thing about Song of Ice and Fire and really kind of setting the game up the way we did, which was to make the group dynamic where you are members of a house and you are vying against other houses. And so you have to keep track of your house resources and raise troops and engage in intrigues and, and fight battles and do all the other cool stuff. But it's not a game where you're kicking down dungeon doors and stealing treasure. Um, although I suppose there's probably room for that in that world too. Um, but so trying to find those spaces where you can do stuff without bumping up against the established uh, IP uh, and and do it in a way that is respectful of the source material. With Dungeons and Dragons and with Dungeons and Dragons that comes Dark Sun, Forgotten Realms, and Eberron, which are the three worlds I got to work with. Um, you have similar problems, but Wizards of the Coast, it seems, is not, and we. And this was kind of a decision point with 4th Edition's advent, was that 4th Edition kind of set all the canon from previous editions kind of on a back burner. Like we could draw inspiration from them, but we were empowered to do something new. So with Dark Sun, we just went back to the right before the freedom novel takes place and we were right after the freedom novel takes place and we were able to say well nothing else that came out for that really matters for our game uh, this is a interpretation of dark sun and we know what's true about the setting but we can develop it in new and interesting ways um and forgotten realms of course is is kind of chained to the books uh, so you have to pay attention to that and you don't want to kill Drist. You don't want to be the guy who does that. Uh, so there's there's always those, those challenges, but there's plenty of room in the Dungeon Dragon sandbox. So you'd always build more and more and more. And there are always dark corners that you can shed a light on. Talking about uh, Dungeons and Dragons, you were part of the 5e design team at some point. Um, how how does someone design? <laughs> a new edition of a game that has such a wide fan base i mean there's a, and there are more now but there there is a lot of ways to play dungeons and dragons even back in two, 2014 uh, people played more like the osr uh, people played more like an action movie uh, i mean Dungeons and Dragons probably has its own uh, challenges uh, as a design team. Uh, what was the the strategy uh, back then? I mean, when you sat down to design it, right? Uh, what started? I uh, let's see. Uh, Chris Perkins recruited me and uh, and pulled me off of regular D and uh, fourth edition products in 2012, and I joined the design team under Rich Baker. Uh, Rich Baker eventually left the team and Monty Cook took over and it was Monty Cook, Bruce Cordell and myself and then Monty left the team and then it became uh, Mike Merles and Jeremy Crawford led and uh, that eventually carried us through to the end of the design cycle. Um, an early conversation about this game. Uh, there were a couple of positions that I was felt very strongly about, and I think we tried to do, I think we did a pretty good job with it, was that 
No edition comes at a time when your campaign ends. Everybody, when the new edition comes out, you're in the middle of a campaign. Guaranteed. Almost guaranteed. You've either a lapsed player, but if you're not a lapsed player, you're going to be in the middle of something. So it was important to me to be able to tell the audience that none of the choices you've made about your character or your campaigns should be invalidated by what we're doing with this game. And in fact, it's it's beholden on it to us to ensure that you can continue telling those stories in as seamless a manner as possible. Though the rule set may change in some degree or some level, uh, the choices you make about race and class and uh, story development and monsters all should be true regardless of which edition you're in. So what we tried to do with 5th edition at first was to create a stripped down, simplified rule set at the very core that would a, enable AD&D style play or even OD&D style play and then use modules that would then expand on that. So that's where you start seeing subclasses and some of the results of that work show up in subclasses. Uh, you also see it in the way feats work and backgrounds. Those are kind of these plugins that we used to uh, allow players to just kind of, or groups to kind of custom build what they wanted. Benefit too is that it also, the game also allows groups to engage with those systems kind of at their own level of interest. Uh, if you are a if you're a novice D&D player, you really don't care about feats or ultimate customization. You can just take the ability score increases and play a perfectly fine game. Similarly, if you want a really complicated fourth edition style character like a fighter, you could go to the battle master where you've got combat superiority dice, engage in a bunch of feats, maybe maybe play with multi-classing. Uh, so there's a there are, there are, it's everything's kind of on this continuum, and we wanted to make sure that simplified play and complex play would be welcome at the same table. Uh, it was a big challenge working in that environment because we were not only a large team that kept getting bigger as more and more people were added to the melting pot, but we were also beholden to an extremely large uh, public play test. And we would receive play, play test reports that would kind of drive a lot of design that we would have to kind of sand off edges that might've been rough in one respect or keep things that we noticed we weren't really wild about. I, for example, and I understand the value of advantage and disadvantage in D&D 5 and the simplicity of just being able to pick up two dice and roll. Uh, I ultimately, at the time, I objected to it because I felt that it injects a degree of swinginess that's already, that just kind of multiplies the swinginess of the D20 and rather than give you a rather than give you an edge or, or uh, an, an actual advantage it just means you're more subject to madness rolls of whatever the d20 wants to spit up i never liked also rolling a 20 and a one on a disadvantage and then having your critical hit be negated but uh i think that the benefit but really what we saw with the play testers was that the kids really liked it they liked being able to pick up the two dice they didn't really care too much about the, the fickleness of the die and so I was able to save my mechanic choice for Demon Lord uh, and use that for other games going forward. There, um, we'll talk about Shadow of the Demon Lord and its relation or, or not with D&D in a bit. But uh, I, a question I always wanted to ask uh, someone in, in the D&D design team and back in, a couple of interviews back, we interviewed Jonathan Tweet, which was in, in third edition. And uh, what is a, a normal day of designing a new version of Dungeons and Dragons like? I mean, the the situation now is different, I know, but what could be happening at the Wizards of the Coast headquarters now? What does it look like for us players that have no idea what designing a game is in, in I, a nine to five job, for example? Right. Uh, there's a lot of screaming, gnashing your teeth. That's not true. Uh, <laughs> really, what happens is uh, you. Uh, I mean, there, there were there were lots of five years was, was a strange animal because it, the design period took almost two years. It did take two years, over two years, to get from uh, concept to uh, pub, to final editing. Um, what I would I worked out of I worked out of state, so I live in the middle of the country, and Seattle is uh, on the west coast. So I would fly up every other month for a week or two and work in the office. And typically what would happen would be that you would be assigned uh, 
some chunk of the game and you would work on that and then you'd populate your day with a bunch of meetings. So if you were able to get about a thousand words in a day, uh, that'd be great, but because your rest of your time is spent arguing about, you know, the, the, the minutia of a delayed blast fireball or whether or not uh, casting spells should provoke free attacks or opportunity attacks. Um, so it was, you would just, it was mostly meetings uh, and play testing. We would, we would run, like there was one point where we had damage dice that were like a pool, uh, kind of like what I do in Weird Wizard. Uh, and we would see, we would use those damage dice as a uh, currency to do cool things for your character. Um, and I remember playing my naked barbarian who was able to just soak all the damage, didn't want any equipment and just pound on people with bare fist to kind of prove the point that that mechanic wasn't really working the way we had, we, we had intended. And so you're looking for ways to kind of bust the game up, break the game up. And then, um, then, you know, there was another time when Rodney Thompson and I, locked ourselves into a room and we figured out what we wanted the mathematical progression to be for that eventually became proficiency bonus. Um, and we did all the math and we sketched it all out, whiteboarded the hell out of it. And it was, it's what we got. Um, we similar things with monster design. We go into the nuts and bolts of what a monster should look like, how much damage you should do, how much damage you can take. We do all that kind of work uh, on the math side first and then it goes to other people usually to do the the writing. And for example, Chris Perkins took the monster manual home one weekend against any without telling anybody and just wrote all the monsters uh, in a weekend and in a big spreadsheet. And then it was a matter of writing story text to wrap around those numbers. So it was kind of a it was it was a very much wild and chaotic. Uh, there were a lot of things going on at all times. Uh, things would change. Directions would change. Uh, teams would sometimes be positioned against each other, uh, so it was a uh, it was an interesting time. I was uh, it, I appreciate the ability to be part of the committee that was able to design this game. I don't think I ever want to do it again. I, I heard you say that in a lot of interviews. What uh, disencouraged you to work in a corporate environment from that moment on? Because after that, you went your own way with your own publishing company, right? Right. I think the, the biggest problem for me was not that, like, I loved working for Wizard of the Coast. I loved working on D&D. That was, uh, I think that's something. And so I don't want to come off and saying that I'm, I'm uh, regret it or resent anything of it. I, I had some very good years with Wizard of the Coast and the design process through fifth edition, there were really great, the highs were really high. Uh, and I, in fact, I remember when we debuted the game at Winter Fantasy in 2013 uh, and just running the game for people who had played that, who'd been, who come from fourth edition and watching their expressions and just the liberate, being liberated to just kind of think about situations and use logic and reason to solve complications rather than looking under character sheets to find the key that will unlock the lock. Uh, that was a powerful moment for, for me as a designer because I felt like we were giving back the D&D experience that folks had really been looking for. Um, but there is something to be said about having to work for somebody else. Uh, I don't particularly thrive in a design by committee. I don't thrive when you are having to argue for ideas you believe in and whoever's best at arguing gets the idea through. Um, there's uh, complications between friendships and also colleagues that just can sometimes make it uh, difficult to uh, navigate the way forward. Um, but I remain on good terms with the folks at Wizards of the Coast and they're all good folks, good people, and they're taking the game in directions that make me very excited. I'm curious to see what they do with 1D&D. &D. Um, uh, it is interesting. Some of the things that are showing up in 1D&D &D are things that we had that wound up on the cutting room floor, but uh, I'll take it. Better late than ever. One, one last question, because you mentioned you locked yourself in a room to do the mathematical progression of uh, 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 proficiency bonus who uh, came with the idea of, of bounties accuracy because what you're talking about is one of the biggest things in in uh, 5e how did uh, did that uh, light bulb turn on in that was mike, that was mike merles's plan from the very beginning uh we were at winter fantasy 
in 2010, 2011, and we were in a side corridor and we were talking about what a fifth edition could look like. And he was 100% behind bannered accuracy. Uh, it was, it's an interesting design decision because what it does do is it allows you to keep the numbers. It allows the, D, the D20 to retain its importance from start to finish because the numbers that you add to the D20 never get to the point where they eclipse uh, the total values in the die. That's interesting. Um, and it also means that characters feel more powerful because they're dishing out greater amounts of DPS or, you know, when they're, when they're hitting harder at higher levels. But trying to find a way to do that at a time when I don't think we were all 100% clear what that would look like, because there is a competing sense uh, or a competing objective, which is, you know, as a fighter, I want to, and this is one of the things that we, we wrestled with during design, was that as a fighter, if I'm fighting a kobold, and if we have truly bounded accuracy, where you're the moment, whatever you add to your d20 never changes, uh, I am no better at hitting or killing kobolds at level 20 than I am at level 1. And that feels wrong. I have the same chance of missing the kobold at level 20 that I do at level 1. So we had to build it, and then also relying on the modifiers that you get for your ability score increases, weren't enough to compensate you, weren't enough to tell that story of how good I am at mowing down hordes of, of minions. So we need to find a way to, to kind of address that. So that's why, while the accuracy is bounded, the range for accuracy does increase within the bounds of the game. It's not limited, it's not locked into one number. We had, and there were also arguments about like, well, if we're going to have better accuracy, we have to have, we have to have maximum target numbers, right? You can't go off the chart can't be open ended like it was in third edition where you could come up with like a dc 100 for swimming up a waterfall or dc 150 for balancing on a cloud uh so those were some of the some of the things that kind of came out of it there's also a shift i think in the way and i don't think this was ever formalized and it was something that i didn't really come to that didn't come to me until much later um but i might have been lurking it might have been kicking around in my in my little attic um that in third edition there's an expectation that the game is always the game system is always running in the background if you're in the imaginary world uh, walking across the floor is a dc zero balance check opening a door is a dc zero strength check unless the door is locked um, and so all these numbers are kind of running around like this matrix and i think that's that's interesting for a simulation perspective but i also think that it's misguided because the game system shouldn't should be there to facilitate the story so you're telling a story and the story can go whatever direction you want but when you hit a spot in the story where you're not sure how to proceed that's when the mechanics come out and help you solve that problem and then you put the mechanics away so you're looking at each other you're talking to each other you're having a conversation you're telling the story not just being a good engineer and keeping track of all the nuts and bolts and dials and whatnot amazing so some of these uh, the later <laughs> then came shadow of the demon lord and you some some of the things you were just saying you you put it in in in, in shadow uh, i think so a chance this was a chance to do what you wanted with your ttrpg your your own TDRPG. Why did you decide to create your own role playing game? Uh, there were a couple of reasons. Uh, chiefly, one, I wanted to create a role playing game that was purely mine, uh, that I didn't have to answer to anybody or get permission or have to have a discussion about. I want to just create a role playing game and get it out there to get it. And it was so in that sense, it was a cathartic experience for me to just kind of vent my spleen and see what comes out. Um, I also didn't want to be beholden to a company, to any other company who would change, who could or would change their rule set. Like I was going to start my own imprint and I could have gone the route of many other folks and just said, you know, I'm just going to make D&D products for the rest of my life. And I had already done D&D products for a really long time from 2008 to 2013, 2014. I really wasn't interested in doing that anymore. Um, so it seemed, and if Wish of the Coast decided at the time, and we saw what happened when they did, to change the terms of the OGL, 
I didn't want to be in a situation where I would be, excuse the expression, bent over a barrel uh, because uh, some corporate pencil pusher bean counter decides we're not making enough money on these million dollar Kickstarters that are, and so we want a piece. Um, I didn't want to be in that situation. Um, so for good or bad, right? I mean, you know, on the bad side, uh, I did not capitalize on the the ocean of support that D and D five had generated. I never expected that D and D five would generate that kind of level of enthusiastic uh, support. Also, didn't expect that it was going to come from non traditional D and D players, like lapsed players or newcomers. These are people who uh, are interested in D and D from watching TV or reading comics or reading books or uh, or in, or eventually streaming. Right? I mean, there's a whole category of D and D fans who will buy the books who don't actually play the game, but watch Matt Mercer and Critical Role or one of the various other streaming things. So those are all D and D ish things that I was unaware of. Even though, even had I been aware of it, though, I would have made Demon Lord and I would have struck out on my own because I really like working for myself. Amazing. So Shadow of the Demon Lord has a dark setting, although with a, love, a lot of humor. <laughs> yes. When you worked for WotC, you also wrote uh, a lot of these dark topics. Is there something that fascinates you about this? I like my evil to not be uh, the mustache twirling uh, guy who ties you to the train tracks and waits for the train to run you over. Uh, I prefer my evil to be Diablo-esque or far worse. Um, so I've always, so from the very beginnings of my career, I've always been able to channel all my interest in horror movies and horror fiction and uh, the darker corners of tabletop role-playing games and bring that stuff into light because I feel like it's easy to become jaded when you're fighting a troll for the 100th time, right? Uh, troll's gonna be up there, he's gonna claw you, he's gonna eat you, that's really gross and terrible. The troll's got rubbery skin and blah, 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 blah. But if you've got a mirror that's leaking mucus that then collects the bottom of the, of the, of the, of the pedestal on which the mirror stands and a giant eyeball forms into that thing and you hear a strange singing noise coming from it, that's gonna make you remember because it's a really gross and upsetting scene that you get to play through at the table. So Demon Lord taps into all my id, uh, for lack of a better uh, uh, source, uh, and then broadcasts it out in a manner like Evil Dead, right? Where it's grotesque, disturbing horror, but also undercut with funniness, right? Like there's a hateful defecation spell that makes you crap yourself. Well, that's a funny spell, but it's in there for a purpose because, you know, you don't want to just big scary demons devouring the world, we need a little bit of levity to kind of, to balance the palate. A little sweet to go with. So, so continuing with Shadow of the Demon Lord, uh, one thing that really stands out is that it solves a lot of common problems that happen at the table. Like uh, the, initi the initiative system is, um, is simple, the adventures, the adventures are meant to be played in one session. You level up after each adventure, and campaigns are short and only last 10 sessions. Why did you focus so much on these things? There have... I can't tell you how many times I have started campaigns, or played in campaigns, or talked to people who played campaigns, uh, who... And then also just actual hard data that came from surveys when I was working at Wizards about how many times games just fall apart. Um, and I think it's part of it is because there's a promise that's unrealized at the table, right? It's like, I'm going to become the most powerful character in the campaign setting or whatever. Uh, it's going to, but there's a, the repeat play is the fact that your character gets a little bit better every time. But if you stretch that time where people have to go like three game sessions before they gain a level, they're going to lose interest. Uh, and when they lose interest, if you go into 10 game sessions and you start, people start dropping out, then your game falls apart and you never get to the really cool bits at the end that there's a whole reason why you came up with a campaign in the first place. So with Demon Lord, I really started thinking about what were the major obstacles 
that prevent games from surviving long enough for people to have a full play experience. Be able to say, yeah, I've played a campaign of a role playing game before. I've played 10 sessions or whatever. And I've told a story with my friends and I saw my character go from farm boy to badass killer. Uh, so how do I do this? And so that's why uh, I felt and, and, yeah, so that was that was that was what drove the, the design. And looking at things like and taking these in pieces, uh, like the initiative system we have for those who are not familiar, Shadow Demon Lord uses a what is there's not a really name for it, but it's a fast flow system. So what happens is you're telling a story, you walk into a dungeon room and there are a bunch of orcs and one of the orcs has a weird horn coming out of his head and he starts screaming at you what and I just say, What do you do? And so the game just moves directly from narrative mode to tactical mode because at what you do you're just going to be acting or reacting to what the scene says and you can do it in any order you don't have to roll dice or have an arrangement for who goes first or who goes when we just assume the players get to go first because they're the heroes uh, and because of that they get to make their action and do their thing or if they want to wait and do more later in the round they can and that gives the monsters a chance to do their thing and that cycles out and you continue going through that fast slow phase and, or cycle series until you are ready to return back to, to the narrative mode. The initiative systems are like my big bugaboo. I cannot stand them. They, I hate the fact that I hate the way that they disrupt what is a natural exchange between player and game master and force you into this mechanized approach, which is purely there to serve some misguided sense of fairness in battle. BS. Cut all that crap out and leave it on a cutter and floor. Uh, it's a holdover from miniatures gaming, and we don't need to worry about it at all. Um, the adventure, the adventure design was another thing that I really was trying to, I was fighting with. There is a time and place for big campaigns like Masks of Nyarlathotep, Attack, right, which is a five-year-long or however long commitment to telling called Cthulhu stories. Totally should exist. Totally should exist. Do I need a 150-page rule book that's about fighting goblins in 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 uh, in a hillside? I don't, because I'm going to be sick of fighting goblins after one night and never want to see another goblin again after I've killed 30 of them. Right? You're you're done. You want to move on to something else. So constructing adventures so they be playable in one session achieves allows the players and the groups to be able to explore more of the game because they're always doing something new every time they get together and also solves the problem of you don't have to worry about if somebody can't make the next session because the next session is a whole new adventure and so you're doing something completely different and that character could just be off doing something else and the story and it solves that story glitch without having to go through acrobatic or hoops to get there Something else I wanted to, to ask you about uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord. You talk about how uh, it was your project. You didn't have to work for anyone else. It was your company, your publishing. And you talk about now about your, your ideas, the things that you didn't like, obviously, about uh, other games, for example, the initiative system. Something you mentioned in some interviews is that uh, designing Shadow of the Demon Lord was a uh, and bear with me with the pronunciation of this word because it's quite different than in Spanish, a cathartic experience for you. Uh, why did you do you say that? Because it's something you mentioned a lot of times. It is. Uh, it was as much fun as designing role playing games can be. Uh, it comes with uh, an outsized burden of frustration and rage at least it does for me uh you live it's like never ever getting out of school you always have a deadline every project you finish just sets up the next project there's going to be always some angry fan who dis who disagrees with the decision you made there are going to be publishers who stiff you on on payments there are going to be projects that fall apart before they ever get off the ground There are going to be bad meetings with your corporate overlords. It's all sorts of things that are going to happen. And that can have a toxic effect, I think, for people who do this for the long haul. Uh, for me, it was, um, I was ready to burn the world down by the time I was done with 5e. So uh, in many ways, I was able to 
channel all of my frustration about gaming and game design and just the entire the hobby and do it in a, in a book that was irreverent, violent, and uh, some places hilarious and some places deeply, deeply upsetting as a way to kind of purge myself of all that, that rage. Uh, so that in that sense, it was very cathartic. Um, I would love to be able to say, and I just lanced the boil and I'm now a happy, sunny person. That's not the case. Uh, in fact, I found that all it managed to do was create an appetite to make even more upsetting things. And so Shadow of the Demon Lord got 200 releases uh, full of upsetting things. Um, so yeah, it's a, it is an ongoing, it's an ongoing wound, it's ongoing wound care. How about that? And is that um, similar to what happened to Punk Apocalyptic, which was the next game you designed with the same or, or a similar system? Because it really has a, a social, uh, I could even say political uh, meaning behind. No? I mean, the one of the the main phrases you had in your your marketing campaign, you, one can search it, is a game where the rich and powerful hid themselves in massive fortified cities and left the rest of the world devastated. That carries a lot of, of meaning. I mean, was it cathartic due to to express yourself in this other game where you can say it's a shit, fuck, and all of those words like you have in your sidebars? Right. Uh, Punk Apocalyptic was an interesting beast because it started with There's a Spanish company called Bad Rural Games who makes Punk Apocalyptic and it's a miniature skirmish style war game. And I had my Spanish translator uh, set me up with them to do a tabletop RPG. And so I used their basics as kind of a foundation. But yeah, that, that game is really all about me. It's just an opportunity for me to be as foul and as filthy and as angry as I want to be. And to kind of poke at the absurdities in the business and expectations about the romance of tabletop role-playing games. Uh, it also, there is a, a strong political undercurrent and one that does kind of, that not kind of, it really reflects my own personal sensibilities that I don't get to broadcast very often. Uh, so my loathing of the rich and powerful uh, is made manifest in this game. Amazing. Um... Now you recently you recently finished the Kickstarter for Shadow of the Weird Wizard, which is another fantasy game with the system of Shadow of the Demon Lord. Why did you choose to make another game in that system? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, when I released Shadow of the Demon Lord, I was immediately met with a bunch of different takes. My, hat, the fa my favorite takes were the ones like, this is exactly what I've been looking for. Filthy, nasty, disgusting, and plays fast, plays great, everything's wonderful. You're a genius, Schwab. That's the take that I wanted. Then there's another take that says, you know, I really like the game. I really like the game, but the world is way, way, way too much for me. Uh, and I found as the years kind of rolled by, that that was a loud and vocal category of people who would be playing Demon Lord if it wasn't for all the shit, blood, and, and others, liquid, solids, and gases that seemed to emanate from that book. Uh, so it was shortly after Demon Lord came out that I started working on a sanitized version. And originally it was just going to be a straightforward sanitized version. That was going to strip out all the dark tradition, dark magic traditions, put it in a new world, and kumbaya, we're done. But the more I worked on it, the more, the less satisfied I was at making just another version, just another edition of Demon Lord. Uh, I wanted to do something new. Um, so Weird Wizard exists in the same cosmology as the world of Demon Lord. Uh, but it is a place where the Demon Lord himself has not yet taken notice. So it is possible for you to turn your campaign into the, the Shadow of the Weird Wizard game into Demon Lord with having all those kind of pieces that are available in the game to turn it into that.
but it is its own thing for sure. And it's more of a game where you're not fighting in an apocalyptic setting, but rather you're trying to protect the people who, the refugees who are fleeing from a collapsing civilization. And that for me is like the apocalypse is not something on a grand scale where it's universe destroying. It's more about the apocalypse of the individual, the catastrophe that befalls families as they're uprooted and forced to head into an unknown against uh, unspeakable odds and, and rebuild their lives. And that seems to be timely in our current global climate as a story that probably doesn't get told enough. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure that that was the key thrust of what we were going to be exploring in this game about rebuilding, but not in a way where you're colonizers, but you're more of protectors and you're working with uh, indigenous peoples in order to create something new. Now there's still going to be monsters and there are demons and there's a void and there are gods of murky aspect that you're not sure what they are or what they're doing. So we've got all those kind of elements in play. And I will include later products in the line will allow you to darken it up a bit, like a, some seasoning to make it feel a little bit more like Demon Lord. But uh, it is, the main push is to keep this something that anybody of all, anybody of any age or disposition or uh, personal uh, grievances, whatever, can play this game and be happy. So the the Kickstarter for Shadows of the Weird Wizard has been a huge success, and it has a lot of content. How do you handle the scope of of this project? Uh, it's a lot. They, it's like the story they say about eating an elephant: you take one bite at a time. Uh, it's a uh, in this case the I was I think I was smart, but I had the game written before I launched the Kickstarter. So the game's done, more or less. We're getting feedback from playtesters or from from uh, backers, uh, and so we make I'm making slight, small changes as we're waiting on the rest of the art to come in, and that will then roll into a period of layout when I won't make any more changes. We'll then put the PDF out, let the people take a look at it, yell or cheer as they feel uh, inclined, uh, and then from there we'll get it to print and we'll be done. Um, the rest of the stuff that comes out for it. it You know, the way I looked at the game when I was building the Kickstarter stretch goals, and I was thinking, well, I'm just going to do this anyway. Why not get paid for it? Uh, and so that was why, you know, the stretch goals come out when they're done. And there's not, they don't have to be out in 10 months. They'll be out over a span of a couple of years. But uh, it should be, it's at a reasonable pace and it allows me to continue to release product uh, well after a game would normally wither in the vine and die. One of the things that's really important to me about Demon Lord, Punk Apocalyptic, When the Wolf Comes, and uh, now Weird Wizard, is that we have regular releases. Uh, I don't. I want to make sure that the game never leaves the public, the public eye. Uh, that's why even now with Weird Wizard on the way, and Demon Lord is almost nine years old, uh, I'm still releasing stuff for Demon Lord because why not? Right. I'm, every time I release an adventure, even if I'm losing a couple hundred bucks on making the adventure, I'm still selling core rule books. And every core rule book that sells, I'm going to sell some more stuff to go along with it. And so that becomes kind of the, 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 the model. And I expect Weird Wizard to be much the same way is that too often people put out a role playing game and they just got a core book. And what do you do with it? Right. You have to make up your own adventures or you have to come up with your own expanded content uh, because the publisher is not willing to invest any more money into producing stuff for it so it just weathers on the vine and dies whereas the digital the mix of digital print model uh keeps that game uh keep it keeps its heart pumping and the audience always feels like they're getting something cool so this is something you mentioned a lot this uh, idea of keeping the game alive right uh, and It's the first time I heard it in, in many of your interviews. It, it seems something quite obvious. It wasn't for me. I'm not a game designer. I wanted to know, how did you come upon this idea? Is this something you learned at Wizards of the Coast? I mean, how did you first think about this idea of, okay, I'm going to, I'm not going only to publish a, uh, a new game and fire and forget it, but I'm going to keep uh, giving the audience at least something little even to keep the game alive. How, how did you come with this idea? 
I think it was mostly experience. Uh, I know that with Song of Ice and Fire, we had a lot of trouble with that game because approvals took as long as they did. So getting the game, the core game out, it sold well, and then the sales drop off when people feel like it's not a supported game. Uh, there is, you know, one of the the great tragedies in our business is that people feel that making adventures is a terrible investment. It's not a terrible investment because every time you make an adventure, you're giving the players something to do, and they, you know, right now Wizards has Wizards has a pretty cunning idea of building out massive adventure content. So you're gonna, it traps you into that long form story. Uh, so you become you're going to play Ravenloft, and you're going to be stuck in Ravenloft for three years as you go through that entire giant book. Uh, so for other people, other companies who are not Wish of the Coast, you have to convince an audience of, of gamers to play your game. And other than just read it on the toilet, you want them to actually play the game. Uh, and so it's a, uh, it just seems like it, if you just release something, and I see this over and over and over again, you know, how many Kickstarters come out and drop off a big book and then there's nothing else for it. And so you just get these shelves loaded with dead games that you can never really, you, you play once or twice. And if you're, you maybe get an adventure, a starting adventure in the book, and then, then you're on your own. It just seemed like it's, for me, it seemed one of those things that I don't understand why no one else is doing it. I mean, I'll be, to be frank, right? It's not, making adventures is expensive. If I put a half page piece of art on the front of that adventure, it's $300. If I it cost me $100 to lay it out, it cost me probably $100 to get it edited. That's $500 I'm already out. So if I sell 100 copies at $2 a piece on drive through and I'm getting $1.70 per sale thereabouts, uh, you can imagine that I'm taking a loss every time I make one. But it, but you just have to look at it. The, you have to take a long, long view. Those adventures continue to sell. They will always sell because they're always going to sell. People always need something to... You're going to be tired of D&D one day or maybe you're already tired of D&D and you don't want to jump into something new. And so what are you going to jump into? Something with a ton of support. Um, many creators say, say that running a Kickstarter is really stressful endeavor. <laughs> I'm sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> Do you see yourself kickstarting another game in the near future? No. no. This, one, this one got really... This one broke me. Uh, I, I don't think I, I want to do it again. Um, I'm looking at, you know, I have to look years ahead and I'm trying to figure out ways to do crowdsource funding without crowdfunding, right? Um, I've thought about an approach where I might put out a book where it's just words with spaces for where the art's going to go. And the more the book sells, the more I populate the book with art, right? So you get a better, you get a better value on the book as it gets prettier and prettier as you go. I've also thought about working with other companies to just have them run the Kickstarter and then just cut me a check when it's done. Um, but there's, you know, at the end of the day, my job should be to just make cool things for people to play with. And more and more, my job is answering backer questions or having to be on, or you're doing, doing interviews, which is great. I love doing interviews. Uh, but doing conventions or running the business, paying taxes and are you know, finding printers and keeping developers and editors on, tar on target. It's all those things. And by the time I, you know, I get like an hour's worth of writing in a day, it's, it's difficult. So uh, to answer your, that, to re-answer your question, I doubt I will do another Kickstarter. I really do. I think this, this may be the one that, that is my, not my swan song as a career, but it's my swan song on the on the Kickstarter front. Okay, and then that's in fair. Um, in some of your interviews, you talk about how creators often face the imposter syndrome. How can a creator handle that? This is a, a hard question. <laughs> I, I really wish I had a magic bullet for that one. Uh, it's something that I, I still grapple with. Uh, You know, it's, it's, I've been doing this for 20 years and, you know, my Kickstarter did pretty well. And, uh, 
But then I look at other Kickstarters and it's like, man, I'm not, not hitting those numbers. What do I need to do? And maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm a hack. Maybe I've got all those things that, you know, that kind of pile on. But I think that if there is a trick to, to doing this for reals, uh, you just have to compartmentalize those doubts and misgivings and, and do the work. Uh, there's a, you're not an imposter if you actually publish something or if you write something when you, you, you're not, you're, you're not because you, you did the thing. Uh, if you are talking about doing the thing and you never actually do the thing, then you're not an imposter either because you're just not doing it. It's just not, you're, you're not a game designer unless you claim to be a game designer. If you haven't designed a game, you can't actually make that claim. So it's, you know, yeah, you're going to screw up and you're going to write garbage and you're going to make a bad mechanic that doesn't really work and you'll have to fix and sometimes you're going to have to eat a plate of crow and apologize to people who gave you money because you screwed up but you've got to but but that's all part of it right that's all part of refining your craft there's never a point when you're done like i've learned everything i need to know about game design i mean every time i open a new rpg or see something that i desperately wish I had thought of first. Uh, it's an opportunity for me to th think about what I can do to be more creative or what can I do to change the my voice so that it, it, it matches or not match but is fresh instead of just writing about elves with red capes or yet another source book about dwarves. Right? It's it's you gotta it's that constant push to improve yourself. And when you stop wanting to improve yourself, that's that's your cue to get the hell out of the business. I think that's probably true for any professional occupation you might have. And um, uh, what would what uh, advice would you give uh, someone that is just starting in the TTRPG industry? I mean, um, someone that wants to be a TTRPG designer. Or, and what's to perhaps do something similar to what what you did? What would you say? There's a there's a there are two answers to this. Uh, one, and I'm going to start with the I think the answer I, I feel better about. But I want to give a caveat first. Um, the caveat is this: I was when I was young, I loved role playing games more than any other kind of form of entertainment. I would rather play a role-playing game than play a video game. I'd rather play a role-playing game than go see a movie or read a comic book or do anything. It was my chief form of entertainment. Now, if you asked me to play a role-playing game, I would find an excuse to get out of it. And part of it is because it's my job. So you have to say, so though you may love it at the start, and that may be the reason why you want to monetize your passion, because you think, you know, if I'm going to make money doing the thing I love, how can I be working? Uh, it will become a part, there will come a point where you realize that this is no longer something you love and you resent it. And so that's a toxic place to be. Uh, and so I recommend to anybody who is making you thinking about a serious go at it, there are ways that you can still enjoy your hobby without having to make money at it. You can still enjoy the hobby as it is and be creative and make worlds and do all that stuff and feel awesome and feel creative without having to try to make money at doing it. But once it becomes your chief form of income or even a substantial amount of your income, then it gets murky. Uh, that was my caveat. The, the first answer is this. You got to write all the time. You got to write and you got to read 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 and you got to write and you got to play and you got to run. You got to do all that stuff because the more the more you fill your head, your head with cool ideas and cool mechanics and the bits and bobs that make RPGs so exciting and interesting to, to fool around with, the better you will be. And before you even try to make your first published work, you should be like you should be super savvy about all sorts of different things and understand why the way this game does its thing as opposed to this game that does this thing. And if you don't like a mechanic, understand why you don't like the mechanic other than just a knee-jerk reaction like, oh, I just don't like the aesthetics of this. Why don't you like that thing? How could you improve it 
what is your solution? So there are some interesting ways for you to kind of get started on that process. And there are a lot of companies out there that are running public play tests. And that's a good way for you to get involved in just looking at game design and its protoplasmic state, right? When it's still not fully formed. Um, because you're, those things are in motion. It also gives you an opportunity to see how that product changes over time and see how the designers who are working on the game respond to that feedback and criticism or and then make adjustments to, to compensate. Uh, the longer, not the longer, but the shorter version, the one that, that assumes you, you've done all that, is that the road to getting into the business was when I started, you get published in Dragon Magazine or Shadis or any one of the other magazines are out there and you get a bunch of credits and that's how you get people to pay attention to you. That's not true anymore because those magazines don't really exist. And there are more astronauts uh, than there are people working in R&D at Wizards of the Coast. So it's not like there's going to be a, a job opportunity waiting for you there. But we've also removed almost all the gatekeepers to the business. Anybody can publish anything on drive through uh, And if you've got, and DMs Guild is a good place to get started. Uh, most uh, tabletop companies that sell through drive through have uh, programs set up for people who want to make their own content for the game to sell it through drive through We have Disciples of the Demon Lord, for example, uh, that lets anybody who wants to make Demon Lord content use our stuff and our templates and produce the game. So those are good ways to kind of build your audience. Uh, and I think building an audience is the, the key. I think there is a lot to be said for having people buy your product because you wrote it rather than buy your product because you're working for somebody else. Uh, that you just worked on the new Book of Giants for Wizard of the Coast or Paizo or whatever. Uh, it doesn't, you know, you're just a name and a list. But if you make something that is all yours, uh, and you have an audience to support you uh, in your endeavors, that's going to give you a longer tail on your career than you would by just chasing down freelance work for two to four cents a word from Joe Schmo publisher. So that's, those are my, that's, that's my bitter cynical advice. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks a lot for that. So finishing up, where can we find more about your projects and anything to come? Sure. Uh, we're, uh, my website is schwalbeentertainment.com. Uh, I'm also on Facebook and we have a Discord group, which is Schwalbe Entertainment. Uh, Discord group is really active. We also have a couple of groups on Facebook as well. Sadly, I'm no longer on Twitter backslash X or whatever it's called this week. Uh, and I'm probably not going to be on Blue Sky or Mastodon or any of the other various clones. So uh, mainly, if you want to keep up with my stuff, uh, you can subscribe to uh, Drive Through and follow our product releases. Um, we've got some really cool things coming up. Uh, we've got a 10 level mega dungeon for Shadow of the Demon Lord, uh, which is broken up into different. Each each level is a new level that you gain. It gets worse the deeper you go. Uh, we're also launching the Return of the Witch King campaign, which is an 11 adventure campaign arc. We've got another. Uh, we have more adventures coming out for Demon Lord as well. Plus, we have more of the Northern Reach to explore, the Patchwork Lands. We've got six more, five or six more missions for Bunk Apocalyptic. Uh, and then I've got a couple of new games that I'm working on in the background that are um, that are that are, are going to be exciting. We'll have a, a modern 1970s interpretation of Shadow of the Weird Wizard, set in, as I said, the 1970s. Uh, there will be. Uh, And there's also a science fiction game in the works, plus the new Clue games, which I'll tell you all about next time. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for being here. I learned a lot in this interview. Uh, it was really enlightening. So as, Thanks. as we always say, Leon, you can say it. Uh, it. It was such a treat having you here. Thank you. Thank you for being here and answer all, all our, our weird questions <laughs> uh, with such honesty. <laughs> That was great. And uh, thank you again. Well, thank you so yeah, much for having me. Really great time. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. It was amazing ch chatting with you. <laughs>